Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today I will be doing a video form of a blog post which I wrote in July of 2021 and just recently reblogged because I added a whole bunch of new um, resources to one of the sections. And this is about extra textual sources for studying the Divine Comedy which many people just don't realize the need to do if they want a complete full understanding and love and respect of the book. It's not a book you can just like read like you know for example like Daniel Steele like at the beach like really quickly and easily. You have to really like get deep down into it and like use outside sources to really understand what's going on and I just you know wish more people would read the book more thoughtfully but anyway let's just get down with it. Well you can read the Commedia without any extra textual study as I did the first time around in late December 2003 through, through March 2004. It's not really something that's recommended if you want more complete understanding unless you're coming to the poem with a pre-existing wealth of knowledge about Catholic theology classical antiquity, including history, myths, and literature, among many other things, medieval Italian history, the Guelph versus Ghibelline power struggle, and Dante's own life, chances are you'll miss out on a lot of things. The most obvious place to start is a translation with lots of supplemental notes and essays. Many come with introductory summaries of each canto and footnotes, but don't always have anything beyond that. Unfortunately, many editions only provide the basics when the entire Commedia is in one volume, you have to buy separate volumes of the three canticles for more in-depth notes. And I guess I kind of understand they want to conserve, like, you know, paper and such when it's like, it would be a super duper long book if they packed it all into one volume. And so it makes like more like financial sense and for like, you know, paper and such to split it into three and have the more in-depth analyses and commentaries and like the each three shorter volumes. But it, obviously, like some people, they just, you know, want one book. It's like much more easier. And I just wish they would have, you know, more in-depth commentaries in a single volume but like you know hopefully maybe one day they will have that you know for a good translation. Because I read the Commedia on my own instead of for a class I was at the mercy of my translation which was on um, Lawrence Binion as I've mentioned many times which provided only the aforementioned footnotes and canto summaries although I'm not sure I would have been emotionally and intellectually ready had I read it in my teens or early 20s. My lifelong advanced reading and love of classic world literature didn't help me with epic po poetry unfortunately. That's just not a literary form most modern people are used to, unless, of course, they've been like, reading it since they were like, you know, five years old or something. Unusual people still do exist, but just most modern people generally do not read epic poetry or even like most things before maybe like the 18th century at the very like earliest. And teachers tend to throw students into the deep end with the Iliad and the Aeneid instead of starting off with something lighter and less dense when I um, read the Iliad, I wasn't a an assigned reading, but I was going to be taking AP English and literature for my senior year of high school. And one of the assigned readings would be um, the Odyssey. And so the summer before senior year, my mother insisted I read the Iliad to get um, some kind of like background and be familiar with it. I Maybe she did assume we would be reading the Iliad as well, but it turned out we only read the Odyssey and I kind of DNF'd it near the end. It was just, you know, so boring and slow going to me. Maybe it was just, you know, a bad translation or just like an older translation and like lack of, you know, supplementary notes and study guides and such. But, you know, even I, like who always read about like maybe like five, four grade levels up for myself at 17 years old, that just wasn't a book I was really like, really like getting interested. That's not the kind of you know thing I would normally read or would be like familiar with that kind of writing. So obviously now I am 42 years old and I really, really would like to read, um, the Iliad, you know, come back and revisit it as an adult with like a much more like modern translation, and some supplementary study guides, because it really sounds like I would really enjoy it. And I'm sorry, you know, I DNF'd it all those years ago and didn't read it all the way through. And it just like went so, so many decades of my life without reading it. That's a huge um, gap, which I need to fill in. Many English teachers also overanalyze everything and kill the joy of reading for pleasure. It's hard to be genuinely moved by or fall in love with a book if you're told what you're supposed to think about it and how to react to it. And like for many years, I genuinely didn't understand why so many of my peers and like just other people in every generation were like bashing and like making fun of these like books you're supposed to read in most like English classes. And now I understand better as an adult, obviously I, I don't share their sentiments. I always love books and reading and classic world literature, but I can kind of understand if you're a, like a reluctant reader or you're not reading like four or five grade levels above you or you're just like genuinely not interested in the topic then here comes an English teacher oh let's talk about conch shells and red riding hats and dirty razors and how all these things like represent super freaking allegories and you know not even reading what it actually says in the book you're just like reading it the way someone is telling you to interpret it and they're just basically like oh you're going to write an essay about this and here's what you're supposed to think about it, instead of just you know god forbid 
actually reading for fun, obviously you should like read for deeper meanings, particularly in English class, but so many English teachers, they just like don't go about it in all the right way. And they, many people say English teachers killed their love of reading for many, many years, which is very unfortunate. Though you don't need to read and study all the books referenced or which influenced it, some more than others, it is helpful to at least have some familiarity with the Aeneid by Virgil, of course. Um, Virgil is Dante's idol, his like great love and literary master. He's, you know, absolutely thrilled to have him with, with him on this other worldly journey and his love for him continues throughout the entire poem even after he um, disappears near the end of Purgatorio. Then there's the Metamorphoses by Ovid. Of course, again, you need really good um, modern translations for these and also possibly with like ex, ex supplementary extra textual notes and commentaries because there are just unfortunately some books the average person these days or even in those days couldn't really, you know, understand unless they have you know, someone helping them and just a general study guide because they're you know, so over your head and not the kind of book you're used to reading. And then the works of Statius, like for example, the Silvae, the Thebiad, and the Achilliad. I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing those Latin words. Um, Statius was Dante's second favorite writer, the one of the great poems of Rome's Silver Age in Latin literature. And he um, joins them in um, Purgatorio and like stays with them through the entire um, rest of Purgatorio. He absolutely really, really loved this guy. And he was you know much more famous and well read back in the Middle Ages. I don't know what happened to make him, you know, no longer be so like widely read among people. And then um, the, the Confessions of St. Augustine, Summa Theologica by St. Thomas Aquinas, neither of which I have read to date. And of course, the Bible, I'll mention that a little bit after I get through this list. The works of Aristotle, especially metaphysics, because like Dante absolutely idolized Aristotle as like most people in the Middle Ages did. You know, this was the guy they read if they were serious about philosophy and just like general, all the other things Aristotle wrote about. Lucan's Pharsalia, which unfortunately I have not read myself either. Hopefully soon I will be like filling in that gap. I haven't read like much of any like Latin literature except for the Aeneid. The works of Horace, especially Ars Poetica and Odes, and the works of Seneca. Now, obviously, most people probably understand there are many, many different translations of the Bible, and, you know, it all comes down to what you're familiar and comfortable with. Like, for example, some people, they might recognize the Bible they grew up with isn't the best translation, or it might not have really good or any study notes, or just not be in, like, updated language, like all those, like, these and thous and warts and wast and dulst and, like, all that other stuff from the King James Bible, but they think, you know, oh, this is the my childhood Bible, which I grew up with, and I'm just, you know, emotionally comfortable with it, you know, obviously, but if you are, you know, religious or just serious about learning about world religions, you should have many different um, translations of the Bible. As I've uh, mentioned in um, two previous videos, um, my um, Bible is um, from the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society of America. I got it as a gift when I was um, one week before my um, 19th birthday back in um, December 1998. Um, Jews call our Bible the Tanakh. We don't um, use the terms Old and New Testament for obvious reasons, for like very similar reasons. We um, Like 99% of the Jewish community never uses the term Judeo-Christian, but that's a whole like other topic for another Thing, but obviously, if you're going to be um, reading the Christian Bible, there are also many, many different translations. Um, there's a really, really cool um, channel I discovered a while ago. I'll link them um, down in the description box, like things he has about you know Bible translations. Just a search query for those. He has all sorts of videos, like comparing which Bible is the best, like different study Bible versions, like comparing and contrasting like translations of like certain passage and multiple Bibles, so you can see which one you might like the best. And like interviewing people who work as Bible translators, it's called on um, the 10 minute. Bible hour and it's um run by a guy named Matt. He seems like a really cool, genuine dude, and his channel has like content that's not just about the Bible, but also he goes around to like different churches and like interviews their priests and their ministers and such, learning about all these different denominations and also lots of really really cool stuff. Like so, if you're a Christian or if you're like not Christian like I am, but just like really love learning about different world religions, I would highly encourage you guys to check it out. And as I mentioned in a previous video, I really don't like the Gutnik Chumash. I would not recommend that at all if you're interested in reading the Torah because it's constantly putting like midrashim, like rabbinical interpretations and imaginations and parentheses after the actual text. Like these things happen nowhere in the Torah and they're not even like indirectly implied. But unfortunately, it's like people like believe, oh, we have to include this and kind of like feeds into the whole like biblical literacy stuff. I really cannot like relate to people who believe the Bible is, you know, like 100% like literally, like, you know, the word of God and such. That's just not the 
modern view. But anyway, it's really important to be familiar with the Bible if you're reading the Divine Comedy, because obviously Dante was a religious Catholic, and it features, you know, so much in the entire poem, you know, like the theology and the history and such like that. It's such a big um, part of, like, Dante's world and the entire medieval world. So obviously that is, like, one of the, like, hallmark books you should be familiar with while you're going to be, I'm reading the Divine Comedy, or should be familiar with before you start reading. I would also recommend reading La Vita Nuova before the Commedia, since it's so much shorter and easier to understand, as well as providing a lot of useful background. It's a shame it's always put in the back of books, which bundle Dante's works together. Instead of first, I understand why they do it, but it makes more sense to read La Vita Nuova first. And I did find this at um, Mr. K's bookshop a while ago. I'm um, a separate um, volume of La Vita Nuova. This is by um, Mark Musa, which includes... Um, an essay and some like commentaries notes I don't like agree with all of his interpretations of like the book like he's like for example he believes um Dante was embarrassed by his youthful um infatuated um love with Beatrice and this book is like making fun of his younger self I really really don't believe that at all that just kind of you know flies in the face of everything he expressed in Divine Comedy this was you know his great love for all you know time and eternity like why would he be making fun of like loving her when he was a, a young man if he's going to feature him in his great magnum opus that just doesn't make sense to me but you know all like translators and such they're allowed to have their own interpretations you can like take it or leave it you know that's the beauty of reading a different like translation or interpretation you know, like you can just see different perspectives and see whether or not you agree with it and like you're allowed to disagree with it as well and here are some other study sources which you might find helpful and i will be i'm putting them all down in the description box below First, there's the Princeton Dante Project, which is full text of all the works, plus lectures, maps, and more, which is really, really good. I've like consulted this many, many times, and they um, use the, the Hollander's translation by um, husband and wife team Robert and Jean Hollander, who unfortunately have um, since passed away. There's um, Digital Dante at Columbia, which is really, really good also, which has videos of lectures, commentaries, images, history, and more, and they use the Alan Mandelbaum translation, which is very, very good, one of the favorites I've read so far. And there's a YouTube channel, Canto per Canto, which is by the um, Dante Society of America, and it features conversations with Dante scholars. Though, unfortunately, they're not really going in order. The last I checked, they hadn't like continued. Uh, they hadn't gone through the entire poem yet, and I really kind of like, disagreed with their choices for some of the people doing these videos because I'm obviously not to sound like an, an Asian prick or anything, but like they were, you know, like twenty something kids doing their like PhD or I think a few even had master's students there so I kind of like you know take you more seriously if you're like you know over the age of 40 and you're a seasoned professor or scholar not some like kid who's like barely out of childhood and just like studying towards your PhD and I really didn't like they injected a political bent into some of the videos like you know bringing up like 21st century like political movements and values and like forcing them into the poem which like doesn't really make sense at all. Obviously you can see like parallels between like Dante's works and like present stuff, but they would just seem kind of like forcing a thing and I really like kind of turned off. They were using the Q word about like the supposedly um same sex attracted men who appear in Inferno, but you know, that's just like I really, really didn't like that aspect of it. But they do have some really, really like good videos in that series. So you can like check it out and basically, you know, with a grain of salt like see which ones you like or like which ones like you really, really don't connect with like I did. And then there's um Dante Notes, which is also from the Dante Society, which is essays by students and scholars. And then there's a publication on Dante Studies, which is a journal. And if you are a member of the Dante Society, which I am, you get um, free access, which is like wonderful. And you can search all these like articles and archives through the many decades. And these are two books I've read, Dante the Poet, The Political Thinker, and The Man by Barbara Reynolds, who has um, since passed on. It was published in 2006, and she was the one who finished um, Dorothy Sayers's translation when she um, died before she had completed it. Um, she finished um, Paradiso for her. And there was um, Dante's Bones, How a Poet Invented Italy by Guy Rafa, which was published in 2020. This book was really, really, really good. I would highly recommend it to you guys. And the YouTube channel by um, Mark Vernon, it has discussions of each canto and other Dantean content. I haven't um, dived too deeply into this yet, but hopefully I will, you know, get to peruse it more in depth someday. And then there's other YouTube channel, Brian Denton, which has summaries and discussions of each canto, but not yet completed as of this date. I think he's only about um, halfway through Purgatorio last time I checked. And then there's um, Tom L.A. Books, who is a really, really genuine bloke. I really enjoy his channel. He's become a good um, YouTube friend, and he has lots of good um, discussions of each canto. He just um, recently completed the entire Dante series, and there's lots of, you know, helpful background information and 
on many details, which I hadn't, you know, considered prior to like watching these videos. It was really, really helpful and resourceful. I was um, reading the Commedia for the, um, the second and the third times just this past year. And there was um, 100 Days of Dante, which just wrapped up on the Western Easter, I think it was on April 17th of this year, which was um, sponsored by Baylor College, but many other colleges were also participating in this. Um, the website includes text, artwork, and study resource, and they, resources, and they still have all their YouTube videos up, both on um, YouTube itself and on their 100 Days of Dante website, and they're taking a bit of a break from their Twitter account now, but they said they would be back, I think, in the autumn with like more fun Dante and content, so I'm looking forward to seeing what they bring out. And there's the Divine Comedy Image Archive, which is kind of self-explanatory artwork and illustrations over the centuries. There's 100 years of Dante's Divine Comedy and Art, which is also kind of self-explanatory. This is a really good resource, The World of Dante. It's a multimedia research tool, which includes encoded Italian text, allowing for structured searches and analyses, an English translation, a timeline, an art gallery, diagrams, music, and interactive maps. And there's Dante Worlds, which is one word, an interactive journey through the afterlife, which is really, really cool. I'll have to explore that in more depth in future. There's the Dartmouth Dante Project, which is a searchable full text database with over 70 commentaries, which is you know just a totally awesome resource. There's Dante Online, which is Italian language resources, and yet another reason why you should want to learn the Italian language so you can read the poem in the original and have like wonderful resources for studying Dante in Italian as well. Then there's the Divine Comedy Digital, which is a collection of artwork from over the centuries. And I feel free to suggest any other helpful scholarly websites, journals, books, and bloggers. I'm really, really, you know, eager to hear more comments and stuff because you can never study the Divine Comedy too much or have, you know, too many books or websites to learn about it in even greater depth. So obviously, like, leave below in the comment box if you have some really good things to recommend to me. Just as Dante needs Virgil to lead him out of the dark forest and start him on the journey of redemption, Beatrice to take him through the final egg, and St. Bernard of Clairvaux to lead him to the final goal. So too do we need teachers, whether professional Dante scholars or passionate lay people, with a wealth of knowledge to increase our understanding. This isn't a journey we should take alone. So thank you very much for listening to the end. I'm welcome to all my new subscribers. I'm really, really surprised I finally got over 100 subscribers recently. I wasn't sure I would like get that within the gear. So I'm hi to all you guys, and I'm really, really getting looking forward to getting to know all of my new subscribers and even older subscribers who haven't yet um, left any comments for me. So, you know, please um, um, like, um, comment, share, and subscribe if you're not already, and I'll see you guys again very soon. Thanks. Bye.